We're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, lovely well, to see you. Where right. are you at the moment? Are you here in the UK? Uh, I'm, I'm going to get California? there as soon as I can. Um, who knows? I mean, it's people. Some other people have better ideas. Let's see. I lost where I put your bio. Is my light okay, or is it too bright? Uh, sounds good to me. I had your bio all up here. Anyway, the light okay, the sound okay. The sound is good, mm -hmm. and uh, your uh, your camera is good. Okay, well, let me do a little introduction. Steve Fox, who's this other gentleman who's a genius, genius, <laughs> uh, uh, and I are co-hosting this for the Silicon Valley Health Institute. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Silicon Valley Health Institute. For 20 years, we've been having top-notch speakers come to meetings, and that includes Daniel Amen, uh, uh, Dr. Klinghart, the functional medicine folks, uh, Ari Vajani and Alessio Fasano, et cetera. So we're trying to reach out to the community, especially Europe. We've got so much talent in the Europe. Now we're evolving and we initially started off as a Smart Life Forum, which we had in, you know, a forum, interchange of information. So we're going to evolve in that direction. In the meantime, we're, I'm tr we're trying to get weekly meetings with top experts. And I mean, Europe's got so many. I mean, Sarah Myhill agreed to come on. Uh, Dolores Cahill, of uh, Irish virologist, who's top notch, is, and um, my favorite healer that I have access to, Anthony Haynes agreed, Guy Hudson, who works in EMF. So all these folks in the UK agreed to come on. So we're evolving. We look forward to your feedback, suggestions for speakers, and for the uh, format. We're going to try to have these as frequently as possible for, for now, and eventually, if we can continue our in-person meetings, we'll continue with the Zoom meetings as well. So we look forward to um, any of your suggestions. So let me tell you about Natasha, but maybe she needs no introduction. Uh, it's just, uh, MD with a, a MD in science and neurology and nutrition. She's graduated with honors as a medical doctor in 1984 from the Bashkir Medical University in Russia. In the following year, she gained a postgraduate degree in neurology after practicing for five years as a neurologist and three years as a neurosurgeon, she started a family and moved to the UK. During that time, she developed her theories on the relationship between neurological disorders and nutrition. She completed a, post, a second postgraduate degree in human nutrition at Sheffield University in the UK. She returned to practice in 2000 and runs the Cambridge Nutrition Clinic. She specialized in nutritional approach as a treatment and has become recognized as one of the world's leading experts in treating children and adults with learning disabilities and other mental disorders. I'd like to make a comment before we start. I work in an emergency room with COVID patients and somehow or other I missed the memo that I'm supposed to be scared of this disease. I mean, to me, if we just do nutrition, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and, you know, just take care of ourselves, we should have a good shot. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, that we're running a series so we can get information out to people. So with that, I welcome Natasha, and we look forward to hearing your wisdom. Thank you. I've written a blog on this subject, on, on this um, quarantine and the virus. And uh, that came out a while ago now, and uh, I'm writing another one now to follow from that. And the, the first blog basically um, showed what many doctors and scientists and microbiologists around the world are speaking out about, <clears throat> that the quarantine and the reaction of our governments and the lockdown for the whole humanity on the planet was completely unwarranted because the virus was not dangerous. It is no more dangerous than any common cold. The vast majority of people under the age of 17 are expected to have no symptoms at all or to have mild symptoms of a common cold. The only people who are seriously affected, people who are on immune suppressing medication, or cancer medication, and other uh, serious drugs which destroy your immune function, and the people who have pre-existing health conditions and who are over 70 years of age, who are elderly people. So these are the only people and the 
if you look at the, uh, the way people pass away at that age, they may have a stroke, they may have a heart attack, they may have some other crisis in their life, but they die from a pneumonia that follows. Usually it is pneumonia that actually finishes the person off. And if for decades we have been recording all deaths from pneumonia at that, in that age group, as some kind of virus, then we would have had a pandemic a long time ago. So these people have pre-existing health conditions and uh, usually they die from pneumonia. And unfortunately now all these cases of pneumonia have been reported as um, COVID-19. And as a result, people think that there is a pandemic, there is an epidemic. <clears throat> what that blog was about is that fear is something that we should not entertain. Fear is far more dangerous than any virus in the world. We should not live in fear of anything because there isn't anything to fear in this world. Fear creates this hormonal storm, neurotransmitter storm, another uh, negative chemistry in the human body, which can cause disease in the first place and can uh, kill a person if a person is ready for that. So we should not be afraid and we should not live in fear. But unfortunately, fear is a tool that has been used by every ruler, every tyrant, every government since time immemorial. Is and it's also a, a major tool that is used by a commercial Thanks industry. Keep Every your commercial mean, industry, all advertising. You know, how do you sell it's things to people? You scare people first, and then you provide a solution. So fear is a major uh, tool. Susan Baker, would you please mute yourself? Oh my goodness, I didn't mute me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Natasha. So, um, in order to control people, you have to frighten them first with something. And then they're in control. And then you can dictate to them what they should do and what they shouldn't do. So the quarantine that has been imposed on the whole humanity is a major exercise in global tyranny. We have come now to uh, the fact that we live in a global community. Yes, we have separate countries, but those countries are not separate anymore. We have a global community on our planet. We have global governments, global industries, global <clears throat> sciences, global everything, pretty much. And this was the first time in the human history that global tyranny has been implemented on the whole of humanity. When the whole humanity has been locked up in their homes and dictated that they cannot come out and they cannot enjoy sunshine and fresh air and they have to wear these silly masks, which do absolutely nothing to stop any virus. It's a complete waste of effort and uh, do all sorts of other pointless things. That is my opinion on this whole thing. Okay, can you go a little more? I, mean, I tend to agree with you, and it seems that some people are holding us at needlepoint that um, back, we, we have to sit and wait, and vaccines is the only answer. Why don't you tell us uh, the role for vac if you know the role of vaccines, or what we can really do to be healthy? If you talk to any serious virologist, microbiologist, immunologist, a person who actually understands how vaccines work and how viruses work, they will tell you that there cannot be any vaccine because common uh, coronaviruses, and there are many, many strains of coronaviruses in nature, we have been living with them for all of our existence on this planet, they mutate from person to person. You can never catch up with this virus. The same applies to this particular virus. You can never catch up with it. So there can be no vaccine for this particular virus. If a vaccine comes out, it will be bogus. And the problem is that people can't wait and they'll be lining up because they live in fear. Majority of humanity likes to live in fear. People can't wait to be afraid of something. They specifically look, it seems, to be afraid of something on a daily basis. And this is something that people need to wake up to. They need to wake up and realize that you cannot live your life in fear. Because if you do that, then you are subject to tyranny. Then you deserve tyranny. You deserve tyrannical governments, deserve tyrannical um, kings and queens and, and you know, shahs and whatever else. And uh, we have to, every one of us has to take responsibility for our own lives, for our own health, 
and for the way we are, the way we uh, have, uh, um, see the world and see, view our lives and uh, conduct our lives and lives of our families, every one of us. And I must say that this lockdown has had many silver linings. I really feel that this has been good for us. It's been a wake-up call for the whole humanity. One simple symbol lining that people had more time to spend at home with themselves, with their thoughts, more time to think. Thinking is a vital activity for a human being. Problem is, we live such busy lives, we rush around all the time, we haven't got a moment to stop and think, to ponder, to analyze our lives, to analyze situations, and to make conclusions, and to understand how things connect and what's going on, really. So people had time to actually think to stop and think and to communicate with each other and to spend more time with their families and to spend more time with their gardens, communing with soil, with nature. So many people told me that my garden has never looked so good <laughs> than after this lockdown. <laughs> yeah, mine too. I wanted to ask as well about the issue of, of fear and the emotional uh, response versus thinking about something. Uh, do you have any guidance for people who do have a fear reaction as to how they could um, mitigate it or um, help um, become more comfortable with the idea of coronavirus as not a threat? We should not live in fear. We should not fear anything because fear is never our friend, has never been our friend. It causes disease, it causes disorder, it causes wars, it cause, causes... Um, resentment and, and other negative emotions and negative attitudes in people. So whenever something scares you, stop and think. Just stop and think. Give yourself time to think and analyze situation, asking questions, why? Why is this? And what follows? And why is that? And what follows? And why is that? And what follows? And the deeper you dig, the deeper you look, the less fear you have the more you realize that there is nothing to fear. Nature, certainly, there is nothing for us to fear in nature. Nature is our friend. Sunshine is our friend. All the microbes that live on our planet are our friends. The important thing for the human body is to have the full community, the diverse community of microbes living in it. Because the recent research in microbiome, which is absolutely exploding, we're researching the microbial community of a human body at such a rate nowadays that it's just amazing. Uh, the more we're researching it, the more we're realizing that actually we are more bacterial, more microbial than human. Our bodies, if you look at the evolutionary biology, our bodies actually were communities of microbes that billions of years ago got together, made pact with each other, with each other, made agreements, contracts with each other. I will do this function, you'll do that function, I will serve each other. Because nature works on cooperation. People have been brainwashed for decades by our mainstream science, again, which is fearful, have given a fearful idea that nature acts on survival of the fittest, that everything in nature eats each other and destroys each other. And if that was the fact, there would be no nature by now. If every bit of nature were destroying each other, there would be no nature. That is a very limited view of, the, of nature, of the world, based on limited facts. When the full picture is lacking, when you look at the full picture, you realize that everything in nature acts on cooperation, not on survival of the fittest at all. Cooperation. And that is what's happened with every animal body, including human body. Microbes came together billions of years ago and started cooperating with each other. If you look at our blood cells, most of them, immune cells, they behave like microbes, they behave, they behave like protozoa. And indeed, they have protozoal genetics in them. Some 10% of human, human genome of viral origin, 25-40% of bacterial origin, 90% of all cells in the human body are in our gut flora. That's a rich microbial community, where there's fungi, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, archaea, worms, flukes, all kinds of creatures living together in, in a mixture, in a balance, in harmony with each other. They all plant each other, harvest each other, eat each other, control each other, not allowing any one of them to get out of control. But we human beings are very good at creating imbalances in nature. We come in, as soon as we find the microbe, we want to kill it. 
whether that's inside our bodies, outside our bodies, in the water, in the soil, anywhere else. And if you kill a bunch of microbes in any uh, natural system, then the rest suddenly get out of control and become a problem because the bunch that you've killed off, we're controlling them. So what we want in our bodies, we want to have harmony and we want to have diversity. We want to have as many microbes inside our bodies and outside us in nature as possible, living in a diverse, balanced, harmonious community. And coronavirus is just another little virus. It's a feeble virus. It's feeble. <laughs> it's really not dangerous at all. There are trillions of far more dangerous viruses in nature, much, much, much more dangerous than this particular one. There is no need to fear any one of them. As long as you have a full microbial community in your body, as long as you have all the bacteria that should be there, all the protozoa, all the fungi that should be there, all the other viruses that should be there, you've got nothing to fear. And in order to do that, in order to have a full, balanced, harmonious microbial community in your body, and your body is a group of microbes, originally. Every cell in your body evolved from some kind of microbe eons ago. Despite the fact that these microbes changed and evolved and became your brain cell, or became your skin cell, or your gut cell, or your lung cell, or your heart cell, doesn't mean that they've forgotten where they came from. They remember who they were billions of years ago. They remember that they were microbes. They've never oh. forgotten that, and they behave that way, and their genetics are showing that. So when we fear microbes, what do we fear? We fear the very essence of ourselves. When we kill microbes, when we attack microbes, what are we attacking? We're attacking the very essence of our own bodies. So, so there's no need to fear any virus, any microbe at all. So um, other than, let's say, what you mentioned about playing in the garden and playing in the dirt to cultivate exposure to microbes and all, what other kinds of dietary and lifestyle and um, supplements and health practices can you suggest for that, for returning to mother nature? Absolutely, that's a good question. Diet, number one, absolutely. We need to go back to traditional way of eating, the way your grandparents ate, the way your great-grandparents ate. Number one, fermented foods, fermentation. Because for millions of years on this planet, humanity didn't have refrigeration. We didn't have freezers and fridges to keep our food for a long time. So how did people preserve their food? People found through experience that the only way to preserve food for long periods of time, for years, is to ferment it. That is why every traditional culture around the world found ways of fermenting everything. Any kind of food can be fermented, including meat, fish, leguminous, grains, vegetables, fruit, milk, anything can be fermented to make fermented foods. And because there were no supermarkets for millions of years on the planet where you can buy anything out of season, you can have your cherries from Chile in the middle of January, or you can have your strawberries from elsewhere, you know, in the middle of winter. Foods were seasonal. People grew them themselves in their own gardens, these foods. And uh, most natural foods don't keep very well. If you killed an animal, if you didn't eat all the meat at once, a few days, that meat will spoil. And you will have no more meat for God knows how long until you catch another animal. If your cabbages have ripened in September in your garden, and cabbages are hard to grow. It takes about eight months to grow cabbages, starting with propagating the little seeds and everything else. You know, once your cabbages are ripe in September, if you don't do something with them, again, they will not keep long. They wilt, they'll rot, and you will have no cabbage until next September. Again, lots of hard work. So people made sauerkraut. Sauerkraut keeps for five, six years, getting better every year. People made ham, people made pancetta, people made salumi, using salt for preserving meat. And when you salt a piece of meat and then you hang it, that meat ferments. It is a, a fermented meat, traditionally made hams and bacon and salamis and sausages and other uh, salt-treated meats are fermented meats. Because there is a carbohydrate in the muscle of a, of a healthy animal called glycogen. It is very similar to starch. This molecule and that is what the microbes ferment. And because in the animal's body, again, majority of that body is microbes. 
microbial community, the microbiome of that animal. So when you hang a beef, when, you, when, when an animal got slaughtered, uh, a bull got slaughtered or bullock, it needs to be hung for about uh, 40 days, minimum a month should be hanging. And the microbes in the meat, the microbes in the tissues of that animal would digest that glycogen, ferment it, producing lots of vitamins, lots of nutrients, making the whole, pre-digesting the whole protein in that meat, making it far more digestible for us and ripening the meat. So properly aged, properly hung meat, even pork should be hung for a week at least. I'm not hearing her. I know. Um, I the, my my screen jumped. I was I was trying to mute somebody and he, yeah, because somebody came through. Somebody, somebody came it. through without being muted, and so there. Okay. Shall I continue? Yes, please. We missed so about we, uh, a minute of you. Okay, we'll edit that because, out. So because uh, humanity didn't have supermarkets and refrigeration for most of our existence on this planet. Every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, people ate a lot of fermented foods. Most of their food was eaten in a fermented form because that's what was preserved and that's what kept for a long time. Everything was fermented. And that has been built into our physiology because what fermentation does, not only fermented foods are teeming with beneficial microbes, which boost our microbial community, with balanced, good microbes, healthy microbes. But fermentation pre-digests the food for us. Because a fact, particularly plant foods, it is a scientific fact that we have known for a long, long time now that the only things on our uh, beautiful planet that can truly digest plants are microbes. The only things. No other creature on the planet can digest plant matter. Mother Nature used that fact, that scientific fact, in creating the rumen of herbivorous animals. Herbivorous animals have a very special digestive system. A cow has a four-chamber stomach, enormous stomach, called the rumen. And these four chambers are full of a rich, balanced, harmonious microbial community. So it isn't the cow who digests the grass that she eats. It's her microbes in the rumen that digest the grass for her. And the cow chews every mouthful of grass about 200 times. She will chew it, she will swallow it, the microbes will work on it, extract what they can, from that mouthful of grass, and then they'll send it back. She'll regurgitate it and chew it more, and then send it back again for the, for the ruminant microbes to work on it again. So that's how uh, uh, herbivorous animals digest plant matter. So we human beings don't have a rumen. We have a small little stomach, which if it is healthy, has virtually no microbes living in it because it produces hydrochloric acid which creates very hostile environment for microbes. That is why plants, generally speaking, are indigestible for human beings. And the people through centuries in traditional cultures have discovered that fact that plants are difficult for them to digest, don't feed them very well, and actually cause digestive problems and other problems in the body. So people try to pre-digest the plant matter prior to swallowing it, prior, before, prior to putting it, putting it into their own digestive systems. They try to pre-digest it outside their own bodies by fermenting most plant matter. And if you look at any traditional cultures that still exist in the world, such as some, some tribes in Africa and other places, they wouldn't dream of having any grain that they grow without fermenting it for a couple of weeks. They just cover it with water, ferment it for a couple of weeks in their African heat, and then they cook it and then they ferment it again before making bread from it or making anything else from it. So, and people ferment vegetables and they fermented fruit and they fermented uh, pretty much everything. So when we eat fermented foods, not only we boost our microbial community, make it more diverse and more harmonious, we eat pre-digested foods, foods that have been digested for us already by microbes. And these microbes release vitamins into the mixture, amino acids and other nutrients, making it much easier for our human body to digest and absorb all those nutrients for us. So fermented foods are not really optional for the human being straight, and they should be eating them all the time. How fermented about uh, are, the, the role of um, fasting? Does that play into fermentation or other aspects of our gut ecology? Fasting? No, fasting is a cleansing procedure for the human body. 
And fasting is a therapeutic cleansing procedure. People do it when they need to cleanse. Veganism is a form of fasting. Many vegans don't realize that. Uh, they think that they're feeding their bodies, not at all. They're not feeding their bodies at all, they are fasting. So vegan, uh, veganism should not be called a diet, it should be called a fast. Because the person eats only plant foods. Remember, plants are indigestible for the human beings. Only microbes can digest plants. So when we are eating only plant matter, we are cleansing in a powerful way because plant, plants have a, a wonderful cleansing ability. They have many, many substances in them which keep our bodies clean on the inside. But they're unable to feed the human body because if you take water out of a human body, about 70% of your body is water, the dry weight of it is 50-50 protein and fat. When we analyze human protein in a laboratory, we find that in its biochemical composition, it's very similar to animal proteins. Proteins in meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. When we analyze human fat in a laboratory, we find the same. That in its biochemical composition, it's very similar to fat coming from meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. These are the only foods that can truly feed and build the physical structure of the human body. Your heavy skeleton, your heavy muscles, your big brain, your big lungs, your big heart, your liver, your digestive system, every bit of your human body uh, is built out of those building materials. Plants also have proteins, also have fats, but in their biochemical composition, they're inappropriate for building our protein and our fat. They are unable to build human body, they're unable to feed human body, the plants. So why do we eat plants at all? Because plants have powerful cleansing substances, they keep us clean on the inside, and they provide some vitamins, some cofactors, some minerals, and some little uh, things for our bodies to use. But you cannot live on plants alone because they do not feed the human body. Many people in our world are toxic and they could do with some cleansing. So fasting is a good idea for many people, but no one can fast forever. Veganism is a form of fasting. There are many, many forms of fasting. Some people fast purely on water. Some people drink juices. Other people have monofasts when they eat a particular fruit and nothing else, or they just drink milk and do nothing else. Or, they, or, or veganism. Veganism is another form of fasting. At certain point, your body will finish cleansing. Fasting will cleanse your body, but will not feed it. And at certain point on a vegan fast, the body will finish cleansing and it will give the person a signal, I'm hungry now. I finished cleansing, feed me. The way the body will give you a signal, it will tell you, it will give you a desire for a piece of meat, for bacon, for eggs, for roasted chicken, for a pot of cream, for a piece of cheese, or, or something else from animal kingdom to feed itself. Problem is many of our vegans are doing it for uh, emotional reasons, ethical reasons, religious reasons, political reasons, and other reasons. They don't listen to their body. They override that signal. They force their body to continue cleansing when the body is asking for feeding, for food. And that is the time when the body has no choice but to start breaking down less important tissues to feed more important organs. So the person starts losing muscle mass and bone mass to feed the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, and other important organs. And the degenerative disease sets in. I have seen no end of vegans who have developed severe mental illnesses, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, autoimmune disease, and other uh, illnesses. It is easy to destroy your body through misguided veganism and vegetarianism. But we digressed a little bit from that. Let's come back to the viruses and let's come back to the microbes. So we talked about the fermented foods, which are very, very important for all of us to eat. But now let's talk about our immune system. We all have a fantastic system in our bodies to protect us from anything in the environment. Not only microbes, that may, uh, may not be too good for us, but from toxins, from electromagnetic pollution, from anything, anything in the environment at all. And that is our immune system. Immune system in many modern humans is not functioning very well because of the environment we have created and because of the way we eat. 
First and foremost, it is a hungry system. It needs feeding with high quality food, nutrient dense food. The foods that feed our immune system are animal foods, not lettuce, not fruit and vegetables, not nuts, not legumes, not beans and chickpeas and hummus and the rest of it. Meat, fish, eggs and dairy. And particularly valuable foods for our immune system are fats. The immune system requires large amounts of fats and fat soluble vitamins. The kind of fats that the immune system needs are animal fats, not vegetable ones. It requires a high proportion of cholesterol, high proportion of saturated fatty acids, and other components of a good animal fat. So cooking should be done, done on animal fats, on pork dripping, on beef fat, lamb fat, goose fat, duck fat, butter, ghee, these kind of fats, and the more the merrier. So the best breakfast for, the, for our immune system, to feed our immune system, are four eggs and bacon. You can have some lettuce with it, you can have some salad with it, which is fine as a complement. Uh, but the, the, the key for the immune system there are the fat and the eggs and the cholesterol. An absolute resuscitation for our immune system is eating liver because liver is very rich in vitamin A and other fat soluble vitamins, as well as the full group of B vitamins, proteins, many amino acids and many other nutrients. It is an absolute resuscitation for the immune system. So for anybody who is worried about COVID-19 or any other virus or any other infection, eat liver on a daily basis. The most delicious way to eat it, and I've even managed to convince some young people on my farm who have never had liver treated and they're enjoying it, is to make a liver pate. You just stir fry, you cut any liver of any animal, fresh liver, into bite-sized pieces, Fry it in a large amount of animal fat until no blood running anymore, but the, the pieces are still pink inside. So don't overcook. Then you cool it down and you don't blend. Then you blend this uh, fried liver with a handful of garlic and the same amount of sour cream, homemade raw sour cream. So for 100 grams of liver, you want 100 grams of sour cream or 100 grams of butter or another animal fat. And if you blend the whole thing together into a puree, make sure to adjust the salt, the black pepper, the garlic, maybe some spices can be added. That makes a beautiful liver pate. You fill ramekin dishes with it, pour some uh, melted fat on top to protect the surface from drying out, and it'll keep in the fridge for two weeks at least, and it can be frozen as well. It will taste just as good from the freezer. So eating some of that on a daily basis, you can forget about any virus. You can forget about any infection altogether. It will just not allow anything like that to happen to you because it will feed your immune system beautifully, keep it robust, keep it strong, and uh, allow it to protect you from anything. Liver is an excellent source of vitamin C, we've discovered recently. It's an excellent source of folate. It's actually an excellent source of everything. You can live on it entirely, even if you eat absolutely nothing. If you live on this liver pate, you can forget about any infection. How about uh, uh, not just fear as a, as a negative emotion, but um, uh, let's say anger and frustration at, for example, all of the restrictions that are being put on people. Um, do you think that also has a negative impact on our, um, our, our viral risks? All negative attitudes alter everything in the human body. They alter your hormonal balance, alter your neurotransmitter balance, or alter your biophysics in the body. We have a new science of biophysics, which are absolutely amazing. Your body is an energetic machine. It works on energy. And what vibration has that energy in your body? Is it a negative vibration or is it a positive vibration? Everything in the world has a positive side, a silver lining. That is why I was talking about the silver linings. So this lockdown is... Uh, um, Yes, if you look at all the negatives, the economy is collapsing, many people lost their jobs, many companies went out of uh, business, bankruptcies are all around us and everything else. But then there are positives. Maybe that business was not going in the right direction. Maybe that person's life who was running that business, he was running fast into a wrong direction. And that bankruptcy stops you dead in your tracks and makes you stop 
and think and re-evaluate your life. Am I doing the right thing in a big way in my life? Am I going in the right direction? Am I treating people around me the right way? Am I spending enough time with my family? Am I giving enough attention to my children, to my wife, to my husband, to my loved ones around me? Am I giving enough attention and love to myself? Maybe I need to reevaluate the whole life. Maybe I need to take a different direction in life. These kind of changes are always painful. They're always difficult and they can be frightening because it is uncertainty. But without uncertainty, without risks, our lives are dull. They're not worth living. It's important to have risks. It's important to take them. It's important to uh, make changes and, and to think long term in your life, not just short term about today and about the bill and about, you know, the bank account and, 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 and long term. Where are you going in the big way in your life? What is your long-term goal? That's right. That's right. What is your long-term goal in life? What is your consciousness doing? What is your soul doing? What is your spirit doing? Mm -hmm. Not just the body. We all have spirits. We all have souls. You and it is important to think about them and, and listen to them. Do you have a concern at all about um, iron accumulation with eating liver on a regular basis? Oh. No have no concern at all. The minerals in our bodies are handled by fat-soluble vitamins. Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K2, and by proteins. Proteins and enzymes that these proteins build. If you eat plenty of fat-soluble vitamins, all the minerals in your body will be handled appropriately. And there is no need to be worried about it at all. Even subclinical hemochromatosis? People with uh, some problems, Hemochromatosis and many other so-called genetic conditions, we don't know everything about them yet. We have assumed that they are genetic. But the more we learn about genetics, the more we realize that epigenetics are teaching us something very different, a new science of epigenetics. This science is teaching us that we are all born with a full choice of genes. Every one of us has got genetics for developing cancer, for developing multiple sclerosis, for developing mental illness or anything, any kind of illness or any kind of uh, uh, disorder, disaster in our lives. But what chooses which genes are going to express themselves or which genes are going to sit there forever and just sleep and never express themselves is the environment that you create inside your body and outside your cells. And a very huge dictator to this genetic uh, roulette is our mind, is our attitudes. Are you positive? Are you glass half full person or you glass half empty person? That chooses your genetics, which genes are going to be expressed and which genes will sleep forever. So if you have a, a negative, angry attitude, angry people, resentful people, vindictive people, nasty people usually develop cancer and very often in their stomach. That has been observed through centuries, through eons, by various doctors and various medical professionals. So it, Fearful people also choose, if you, if you live in fear most of, life, of your life, you are choosing certain genes in your body. Not consciously, but your fear is choosing genetics for you and it's leading you in the direction of diseases, of course. So every one of us, this very moment, can change your genetics, can change the choices you make in your genetics, every one of us, by changing your attitude to life. If you say no to fear, absolutely just no to fear, say goodbye to fear, and do everything in, in possible to live in a positive frame of mind, live in a, in a glass half full frame of mind, that the world is harmonious and the world is beautiful and everything's right in this world and there, there's so much beauty and so much happiness and so much love in the world to focus upon. If you focus on all of that, you are choosing your genetics. You are choosing good health. You are choosing vitality. You are choosing rejuvenation. You are choosing being, you know, youthful in your 70s and 80s and 60s uh, rather than developing illnesses. We all have a choice. And that is a wonderful, wonderful development. Wonderful, wonderful thing. What do you think about uh, probiotics as... Um, a potential alternative to um, cultured food? And can you actually culture foods with probiotics? 
you can. I use probiotics in my clinic. Uh, I have developed the GAPS nutritional protocol, as people know, and uh, using probiotics with certain patients is important. It's very helpful for a period of time, while these people are developing their skills in fermenting food. Once the person starts consuming plenty of home fermented foods, we can gradually remove probiotics, commercial probiotics, and replace them with fermented foods. Because supplements are expensive, it is okay to invest in that for a period of time uh, while you're in acute stage of healing and you need that little help. But long term, for the rest of your life, it is far more natural to consume probiotic microbes in the form of home fermented foods. Sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, yogurt, cheese, and other fermented foods that you can make at home yourself. Okay. Um, there's a question about uh, uh, wine as uh, a fermented food, and um, this person asks about um, uh, daily wine consumption. What we call wine today is very, very different from what humanity consumed as wine for thousands and thousands of years. Very, very different. I have a, a, a joke that my doctor friends have sent to me that <laughs> a chronic alcoholic called Pedro, somebody rather died in Spain recently. He's consumed two or three bottles of his own homemade wine all of his life, every single day. I finally succumbed at the age of 106 to this habit. <laughs> so this mind man lived for 106 years, drinking two or three bottles of his homemade wine. But of course, that homemade wine has no sorbates in it, no sulfates in it, no chemicals added of any description, no pesticides. His grapes were organic, they were grown naturally, and he made that wine with his own fair hands, uh, uh, you, you know, in his own home environment. I make my own wine, I'm, I'm an organic farmer. We grow uh, blackberries, logan berries, black currants, strawberries, and all sorts of other berries, uh, because grapes don't grow very well in Britain. Um, some varieties apparently do, but we tried, it didn't work for us. So we make wine from uh, the berries that we have. And all you need for that is just berries and a bit of panela, a bit of natural sugar cane, and the uh, sugar cane juice. That juice gets consumed by the yeasts and the whole mixture. And uh, the resulting wine is very clean, organic, and doesn't leave any hangover or anything else. And everybody enjoys that. Well, my family, all my volunteers and guests enjoy that. <laughs> and I'm sure that that kind of wine does uh, no harm to us. And it isn't very strong. With every alcoholic beverage, what we need to understand that we're putting um, a lot of work on our liver when we consume alcohol. So if a person is already toxic, if you already have a lot of toxicity in your body, either from your gut, from your professional occupation, from chemicals that you've been exposed to, or from some other environmental influences, then your liver is already working very hard. It's not a good idea to add another workload on it in the form of alcohol. Because while the liver is processing alcohol, everything else is put on hold. You're not clearing out toxins from your body. But if you live in a natural environment, on your own farm, producing organic food, your body is generally speaking clean, then homemade wine is wonderful. You can have it in moderate amounts. Beer is a different thing, particularly commercial beers. Beer is a syrup. Majority of sugars on our planet don't taste sweet. They actually taste bitter or neutral. And these are the kind of sugars that the beer is made from. Beer is a syrup. Consumption of beer, wide consumption of beer, is a major cause for metabolic syndrome in our modern world. The beer belly, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the heart disease, the cancer, these are all manifestations of metabolic syndrome. People like that uh, who have any predisposition to any of those problems should stay away from beer altogether, which for many men is difficult, as I understand. Um, I've got a question about whether or not you've dealt with um, patients that have sensitivity to any of the 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G um, uh, radiation bands who have used nutrition or diet or lifestyle to uh, mitigate their sensitivity? Absolutely, that's a very good question. Very good question. 
people who are malnourished, people who have abnormal gut flora. Abnormal gut flora is an epidemic now. I call it a GAPS epidemic, gut and psychology syndrome and gut and physiology syndrome epidemic in the world. It's an absolute epidemic. And uh, when the gut flora is abnormal, the gut wall gets damaged, it becomes porous and leaky. Abnormal mixture of microbes digest food in their own sweet way, producing millions of very poisonous chemicals. These poisonous chemicals absorb through the damaged gut wall, creating a river of toxicity coming from the gut into the body. Wherever these toxins get you, through the blood, through the lymph, they will cause disease. That can be autoimmune disease, it can be chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, allergies, mental illnesses, learning disabilities, can be anything, absolutely anything. All disease begins in the gut. I have no doubt about it. The, the, the stream of water-soluble things coming from the gut hit the liver first. So the liver gets very quickly blocked in these people. It's unable to process toxicity. All liver functions suffer. These people have a congested, blocked liver, uh, which cannot uh, neutralize toxins. When a person is in that situation already, any other influence is not received by the body very well. Dirty electricity, 4G, 5G, uh, you know, any, any, uh, any other electromagnetic pollution affects these people very seriously. I have children in my clinic who would not fall asleep until the whole house is disconnected from electricity. The whole house. One big switch has to be turned off. Freezers, refrigerators, computers, TVs, electronic clocks, everything has to be completely disconnected. Only then the baby would calm down and sleep. I have families with children in whom even that didn't work until people moved out of the apartment to a single house. So there are no neighbors in the middle of nowhere. And even then they have to switch off all electric, electric devices in the house. Last year, a group of scientists all over the world uh, have compiled data on what we already know and have researched on the effects of electromagnetic pollution on the human body. And there are best part of 900 studies already conducted which show that uh, electromagnetic pollution our computers particularly mobile phones particularly modern generation of smart technologies smart mobile phones cause brain cancer cause thyroid cancer because the batteries in these mobile phones are at the bottom of the phone so if a person holds it to their ear when they're talking to someone the batteries are just on the level of the thyroid gland Thyroid cancer is just spiking and it's, it's, uh, the, the rates are growing very, very fast. They cause heart rhythm abnormalities because the heart works on electricity and the whole electrical field gets altered in the body with the use of mobile technologies and other um, electromagnetic pollution. And um, gonads are very weak, very, very, very susceptible to damage from electromagnetic pollution, particularly mobile phones. Our ovaries, testes and men, and other reproductive organs. And the problem is all our young generation are, ca are carrying their mobile phones in their genes, in the pockets of their genes. We already have an epidemic of infertility and that is predicted to skyrocket in the next generations of young people that are uh, coming up. They haven't tried to have children yet, those people. So we'll see what happens there. All of this is already solid science. We have more than 900 scientific studies to show that this is happening. Brain cancers, thyroid cancers, infertility, damage to heart rhythm, and, and, and other damage in the body. So these scientists have compiled all that data and sent it to all the major governments of the world, the European community, the US government, and other governments around the world, warning them that 5G should not be launched. We don't know yet, nobody has researched what effect this technology will have on human health, and not only human health on health of other creatures on our planet. It is predicted that 5G will kill insects, kill trees, damage all, all sorts of life forms on our planet and make them extinct. But based on what we already have, on the knowledge that we already have on mobile technologies with 4G and 3G and other uh, technologies, we can predict that the damage is going to be very serious. The problem is that Western governments either ignored this uh, petition or send the standard reply to the scientists saying that uh, they trust the industry which is installing so as i understand industry is going ahead and installing 5g already all over the world it is already happening 
and we're already receiving uh, negative reports from different places where people say that their gardens are producing no flowers and no seed and that uh, insects are not there, bees are not there. So it is very worrying, very, very worrying. But as a collective, as humanity, we should be able to do something about this. In the meantime, in your little individual world, wherever you are, there are things that you can do. Look after your gut flora. Heal and seal your gut wall with the use of GAPS nutritional protocol. Look after your immune system by feeding it properly and not poisoning it by Coca-Colas and soft drinks and sugar, 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 and soya and processed uh, foods and vegetable oils and chemicals in the food by poisoning your body with tobacco, alcohol, or whatever else uh, people do. Look after your body and it will be far more robust and strong and able to withstand all of this damaging technologies. Um, let me ask about uh, the fermented food issue and bioculture. Um, is it important to eat a variety of fermented foods with different microbe cultures fermenting in the, in the different foods? It is, it is important. But the thing is, you see, every jar of sauerkraut is different when you make it at home. If you don't buy it from some manufacturer, make it at home. It's so easy to make and it's fun to make it because every bunch of cabbages, even every cabbage has its own microbial community on it, if it's organic. And it's important to grow your own cabbage in the garden because once you've made it with your own cabbage, you'll realize that no sauerkraut in the world is better than that one. You can never make that quality from cabbage that you bought in a supermarket. We all should go back to soil. We all should have gardens. We all should dig up those useless lawns that people are mowing everywhere. Lawns all over the world cover such a huge territory now. And it is a desert for bees. It is a desert for insects. It's killing them. It's depriving them of forage. Because there's nothing on that lawn for any insect or any bee or any other creature on the planet to benefit from. Dig up those useless lawns. Make a vegetable garden. Pile up some manure from a local uh, horse stables. Pile up some compost on top and plant your vegetables. And you will never taste better vegetables in the world. We should all go back to soil. We should all go back to gardening. We should all produce our own food. And uh, many of my patients who have been through the GAPS nutritional protocol, city people, not farmers, people who have never grown a thing in their lives, now bought pieces of land and they have goats. Many even have a house cow and have gardens and orchards and bees. They're becoming beekeepers and they couldn't be happier. Just couldn't be happier. Because only nature, only contact with nature holds the truth. There is no truth in humanity, I'm afraid to say. I know this sounds controversial. <laughs> there is no truth in humanity. Truth exists only in mother nature. Health exists only in mother nature. Beauty, real beauty and love and harmony can only exist in mother nature. So if any human being is seeking those things, go back to nature, go back to soil, work with it, respect it, don't dictate to it and don't impose things on it. Listen to it, play with it, assist it, be a partner with it, and then you will find all those things. Susan, do you have some questions? Yeah, um, I'm concerned as you're focusing on that, it seems to be generating a climate of fear and, you know, and they're holding us at needle point. They seem to be giving us the message that uh, vaccines are the only way out. I mean, physicians I work with in the emergency room, they're, you know, they're, I mean, and nurses saying, oh, we got to get the vaccines and anyone doesn't get the vaccine. Oh, they're problematic. I mean, they're divide. It seems to be a lot of division and generating fear. And this concerns me at the same time. Uh, vitamin C in, so has been very helpful to many people, uh, but uh, the CEO of YouTube said that they're going to censor any information on vitamin C and turmeric, etc. Uh, this is concerning. Also, uh, Dolores Cahill said, I don't know if this is true, maybe, I don't know, but that the IMF had bonds that there'll be, be, be a pandemic by March 2020. Sounds a little bit 
out there. But anyway, I'm just concerned the way this is going. How as individuals can we kind of make this go in the right direction? Every single one of us needs to go back to grassroots. Stand on the soil on your own two feet and take responsibility for your life, for your health, for your children. Stop looking up to governments for, take, for making decisions for you. Make your own decisions. Stop, stop looking up to medical professional for looking after your health. Medical profession is not about health, it's about disease. Health doesn't exist in medical profession. Doctors actually are very unhealthy people, most of them, and they die at a young age from various diseases because medicine is about disease. It is not about health. If health you want, you take responsibility for your own body and the bodies of your families. You take responsibility for your own health. Live a clean lifestyle, eat the right diet, eat properly, find the proper food. And that means do not buy your food in a supermarket. Who stocks our supermarkets? Industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture is all about money, all about profit. Health and good food and nutrition don't enter the calculation at all. They what produce, about talking about commodities, your, for, your they produce diet. commodities for money. That's all they do. So do not buy your food in supermarkets. There are majority, if you, if you, if, if, if you realize it, if you look at it, 75% to 80% of humanity are not fed by industrial agriculture. These big guys will want you to believe that they're feeding the world. No, they're not. That's a lie. The world feeds itself. Vast majority of people, 75 to 85% of people who live in third world countries, majority of them, they live in subsistence farming. They have a goat in their back garden. They have an orchard. They have a garden. They forage. They, they have their chickens running around under their feet. So they produce their own food. That is why they're infinitely healthier than people in the, in the first world. Infinitely healthier. Because they're eating clean food, real food, the kind of food that Mother Nature intended for us. Everything in a supermarket is a lie. Twisted, manipulated, chemicalized, irradiated. Just the things that are done to food before it's packaged, before it's packaged and put in a supermarket, you wouldn't believe if you start looking into it. The more I started looking into it, the more my hair was just raising on my head. You cannot trust anything you buy in a supermarket. The biggest lie in the last decade in the world is organics. You cannot trust organic label in a supermarket. Please research this subject. Organics are, have been corrupted, thoroughly corrupted by industrial agriculture because some 20 years ago, people wanted more organic food. The concept of organics started uh, developing. And uh, of course, the big agriculture wanted a piece of that pie. And because they hold in their grip all agricultural policies of Western governments, they dictate agricultural policies of Western governments. Governments just do what, you know, what these companies tell them to do. It's yavol. And they just do it. <laughs> Whatever these companies tell them to do, Monsanto, Bayer, DuPont, Ginsenta, that's what governments repeat. This, these companies rule Western government agricultural policies. And uh, they have changed all organic standards. They have changed all legislations. So what organic labels in the supermarkets now, you simply cannot trust it anymore. Nevertheless, there are hundreds and hundreds of honest, decent, good farmers in the Western world, in America, in Europe, in Australia, in other places all over the world. These farmers exist. Problem is the governments, which are subsidizing the big agriculture, the industrial agriculture, make lives very difficult for the real organic farmers. The only farmers that are surviving are the ones who have a strong customer base. Find these farmers. You can find them on the local farmers markets or go to westernaprice.org, Western A Price foundation website they list a comprehensive list of real farmers who will provide you with real food real organics real biodynamics real clean food that has been produced with love with care these are farmers who love their land who love their soil who love their animals and birds love their gardens love their orchards they put their love into these foods find these farmers buy exclusively from them Many people in the cities nowadays form cooperatives where one person drives out of the city and uh, brings all the eggs and milk for 
10 people and these people then come to your house. Or if there are cooperatives like that, then the farmers will deliver to the cooperative. And then the whole group can come and pick up from the cooperative what they want. So it doesn't mean that you have to drive out of city to buy every little thing, not at all. You can get organized and people are getting organized. It is essential for us to support these farmers because real organic farms are going out of business one by one every single day in the Western world because of the legislations that the uh, big agriculture imposed on organics. They are the only companies that can afford to follow those legislations. Real farmers cannot afford them, this legislation. They cannot afford to follow these rules. They just go out of business. So buy directly from these farmers. You'll be supporting a good person. And at the same time, you'll be getting the best quality food for your own family. How about uh, giving us a, um, an ABC lesson beginner for the GAPS diet? The GAPS diet was born 20 years ago. Uh, it started from my own child and my own family who had autism. He is not autistic anymore. He's leading a normal life. He's recovered fully. And thousands and thousands of other patients in my clinic. I have accumulated information and then compiled it and written my first GAPS book called Gut and Psychology Syndrome. Natural treatment for autism, dyslexia, ADHD, ADD, schizophrenia, epilepsy, depression, and other mental illnesses. That book has been translated into 20 languages now all over the world, which just shows that this knowledge is very much in need, very much needed in all the countries of the world. I'm not translating my book. These are people who uh, have English. They bought the book in the English language. They read it, they implemented it in their own families. They got results and they want to bring that information into their own countries. So they contact me and ask me whether they can translate it into this language, into their own language. All I do is just uh, uh, give these people permission. That's how we got 20 translations of the GAPS book. So, and then we have another six translations coming up. GAPS is an epidemic all over the world. People have abnormal gut flora. That is what GAPS is. And the problem is that the abnormal gut flora is passed from generation to generation. Mother and father, pass their gut flora to the baby at the moment of birth. Before I talk about the health of a child in my clinic, I always talk about the health of the parents and grandparents and siblings, the whole family. And a typical picture has emerged. If grandparents got perfectly healthy, good, normal gut flora because they were born maybe before the Second World War, then after the Second World War, they got a couple of courses of antibiotics because antibiotics came onto the market in the 50s and 60s and damage their gut flora a little bit. Antibiotics kill off only bacteria. These bacteria were controlling fungi, viruses, protozoa, archaea, and many other creatures in your gut and the rest of your body. Every time you take antibiotics, you're killing off bacteria. And once you've removed a bunch of bacteria, all these other creatures get out of control immediately. You have imbalance. Every time you take antibiotics, you're creating an imbalance in your body. You're damaging your microbial community in your body. And problem is, majority of agricultural chemicals used by our industrial agriculture are antibiotics in their nature. So today, if you buy your food from a supermarket, you're eating antibiotics for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, damaging your microbiome, damaging your microbial community in your body. So if grandparents got a couple of courses of antibiotics, which damage their gut flora a little bit, they pass that slightly damaged gut flora to their children at the moment of birth, and then their children grew up in a very different world. They grew up in a world where antibiotics were given to them for every cough and sneeze throughout their childhood, where industrial agriculture appeared on the planet, so their food became laced with chemicals more and more, antibiotic-like chemicals, where vaccinations came into the world and vaccinations damaged the immune system and the microbiome of the person uh, quite seriously. So these children were vaccinated. Junk food came onto the market, so children started existing more and more on, gap, on, on junk food. And uh, girls in that generation are put on a contraceptive pill at the age of 15, 16, and they take the pill for quite a long time before they're ready to start their family. Contraceptive pill has a devastating effect on the gut flora composition and uh, the rest of the microbiome of the human body. So by the time that generation of young people decided to, to have their first baby, their gut flora is seriously damaged. And that is what they pass to their baby at the moment of birth. 
This situation has been developing, accelerating, building up every year. Even five years ago, mothers who had babies in my clinic, their babies were slightly healthier, a bit stronger, with a bit better constitution than babies that I see today. This is an absolute avalanche coming upon humanity. And it is the English-speaking countries that are at the forefront of this destructive avalanche. It is this epidemic of gaps that is the cause, from my point of view, the root cause of autism epidemic, epidemic of ADHD, epidemic of diabetes type 1, epilepsy, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, other mental illnesses and physical illnesses in our children. Today, we have hardly any healthy children in the first world. There are very few healthy children around. Every child pretty much has some kind of allergy or asthma or digestive problems or learning problems or disability of some sort, some kind of problem today. So, and, and, and that, that is becoming worse and worse. Scientists have already predicted, researchers have already predicted that in the next five years, we will, will be diagnosing one boy in two with autism in the English speaking countries, half. Girls will have slightly less because they have a different statistic, but that curve is not going to stop there. It will continue climbing. Very soon, all of our children will be autistic. That is what we, where we're heading. And the other half of, of kids are not going to be healthy either. They're going to have ADHD, ADD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, diabetes type 1, allergies, autoimmunity, asthma, eczema, and all sorts of other problems. So the question is, who's going to look after these children? They're elderly parents. And when the parents die, then what? So big questions, and our governments are not interested in that questions. They're far more interested in scaring the population with COVID-19, or SARS, or bird flu, or swine flu, or some other hoax, and making money. Because every government that we elect in the Western world only comes in for four years. None of them burden their little brains with the long-term plans. None of them. They're only interested in surviving for four years. As long as that situation continues in the world, we are heading for disasters. Humanity is heading for complete disaster. We have to have a long-term plan for the whole of humanity. Where is humanity is heading? Nobody knows. Nobody is even thinking about it. No government, no global government, not even scientists, not even philosophers are bothering their little brains with that. Where is humanity heading? Where is the long-term plan? Where are we going as humanity, as one body? Let alone as individual countries, nobody's making long-term plans. That is why our governments are burying their heads in the sun. They don't want to see the autism epidemic. They're not interested. Let's make some vaccines and make a, a, a bunch of money right now. What happens after us? Another party will be elected. That's not our problem anymore. We have to wake up, and I think that is the silver lining of this lockdown, where all of us were stopped in our tracks from being so busy, 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 running around. We were made to sit at home, we were made to think, to commune with nature, to dig in our gardens, to look after you know, something that we have, to look after our families, our children, to spend more time with our children. We need to all stop and think, where is humanity heading? What do we want out of our, of our lives? What world do we want to leave to our children? Because the world that we're leaving to our children right now is a disaster. We need to be hanging our heads in shame of what we are doing to the world, of what we are leaving to our children. We need to stop and think about it. We need to start rectifying the disasters that we have created, the mistakes that we have made. And we need to apologize to our children for what we have done to this planet already and what we continue to do to our planet. There is an intelligent scale that has been developed by philosophers, clever people, very intelligent people. Where at the top of the intelligence scales, they have put a single individual thinking for himself or herself. It's the same as Galileo Galilei said that, you know, there is a, there is a famous quote. I think it's his quote saying that uh, a thinking of many cannot compare with the humble reasoning of a single individual. 
think for yourself as a single individual. You are the pinnacle of intelligence scale in the world. Then underneath that, there is a, a group of people, a few people together thinking about a problem together, putting their heads together. And that already introduces discord because everybody pulls in their own direction. They have their personal interests. And the result that uh, comes out of that discussion usually is less beneficial to the problem itself than if one single individual was thinking about it and making a decision. Then further down, we have a local council. Further down, we have a, a city council. Then further down, we have a government of a country. Further down, we have a collective government of many countries. The, the more people accumulate in making a particular decision to rectify a particular problem, the less intelligence there is in those decisions. The less intelligence remains. So take responsibility, humans, for this planet, for the whole of humanity, for your own life, for your children's lives, for what is going on in the world. Every single individual, every one of us, must honestly look at what I am doing with my life. What I am doing with this planet as I am alone, me. Take responsibility for that. Start making decisions to be brutally honest with ourselves, to be brutally honest with other people around and with our planet. Um, in terms of uh, supplementing the GAPS diet, do you have recommendations and disrecommendations? Supplements are a multi, multi billion industry, and uh, many so called natural practitioners are using them the same way doctors use pharmaceuticals. Even doctors now are using supplements, they replace pharmaceuticals with uh, natural supplements, using them exactly the same way. Human body is not silly, it's not foolish. Food is the source of nourishment for the human body. We're supposed to be nourished by food, not by pills. So if you are on the right diet, if you're eating nutrient-dense diets, such as a GAPS diet, a Weston A. Price Foundation diet, then you can forget about pills. You don't have to spend money on those. In the GAPS nutritional protocol, we use literally a handful of supplements, and even those supplements are foods. We use probiotics, we use cod liver oil, we use fish oils, and that's about it for the majority of people. Then in individual cases, there are some supplements that are helpful for individual problems and individual situations. And all of these supplements should only be taken for a small period of time, for a short period of time, when your body needs them. Once you've implemented the diet and you started feeding yourself properly, you can dis dispense of all those pills. People are not supposed to be living on supplements permanently. But of course, companies which produce them would want you to think otherwise. How about uh, if you can't stand the taste of liver, um, desiccated liver supplements? That's not enough. Look for different recipes of liver. There are many different recipes of preparing liver. You will find the one that you like. Mm -hmm. I'm at the end of my questions. <laughs> well, I would like to conclude if we are running out of time. Are we? Or have we got no, more time? No, we have more time. We're just running out of questions. Do, would you like to talk about something new? <laughs> well, I'm working on my second GAPS book called Gutman Physiology Syndrome. I'm doing the, uh, the tedious bits now, the references and the index and all that. So hopefully this book will come out this year. This book will focus, my first GAPS book focused on the brain, on the function of the brain and mental illnesses. This book will focus on the rest of the body. So I'll be talking about autoimmune disease, uh, diseases which uh, are described by fatigue, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, myalgic encephalomyelitis, allergies, asthma, eczema, chronic cystitis, uh, and various, various other chronic diseases. Because from my point of view, all diseases begin in the gut. This is a phrase that Hippocrates coined all those years ago. And uh, 
thousands of years ago, he made a conclusion that all diseases begin in the gut. And the more we learn with our modern scientific tools, the more we realize just how correct he was. Indeed, every disease begins in the gut. And uh, that's what this book will be about. It will update the GAPS diet because GAPS diet continues evolving. Uh, we have patients who are more and more complicated, more and more difficult to help because every disease is becoming more and more severe in the world. Our statistics are changing. So the diet has to evolve to serve all of those people in all of those situations. So that's the book that's coming out. And uh, another book that I have is called uh, Put Your Heart in Your Mouth, What Really Causes Heart Disease and What We Can Do to Prevent and Even Reverse It. And that book will, uh, focuses on the, <clears throat> the idea that animal fats and cholesterol cause heart disease. That's, uh, uh, I explain that where that idea comes from in this book and what we should do to really prevent heart disease, to really deal with that situation. No matter how much real, true, honest science shouting from tops of the hills, tops of the mountains to the whole world, eggs and bacon don't cause heart disease, butter doesn't cause heart disease, meat, red meat is good for us, Animal foods don't cause heart disease. It just falls completely on the fears of the mainstream. We have the mainstream of humanity, which lives in fear, which listens to the governments and trusts their governments, trusts the medical profession, trusts the pharmaceutical industry and other people. But what I explain in that book that the idea of cholesterol and heart disease, uh, causing heart disease comes from a, a so-called diet heart hypothesis which was first proposed in the 1952 by small scientists from some small laboratory in America. At the time, the heart disease was becoming a problem in America, a big problem. And the American government were keen to give some explanation to people what's going on and that they're in control. So when these little scientists said, maybe it's fats, that idea was taken and money started pouring, pouring in and institutions being set up and research being set up and the media uh, trumpeted it all to the population that now we know what causes heart disease. So it's animal fats cause heart disease. Later on, the same person proposed that it's cholesterol causes heart disease. Since then, science from all over the world, real true science, honest science, because we have the other science too, which is funded by commercial companies, who demand certain findings from that science. But the real honest science has proven conclusively that cholesterol and animal fats have nothing to do with heart disease. In fact, they prevent it and reverse it. Trouble is, while the science was working on this hypothesis, huge and very powerful and very wealthy political and commercial machine grew up based on the diet heart hypothesis. Pharmaceutical industry is making billions, trillions now. Medical industry is making billions. Western governments are making billions. Food industry is making trillions. And these very powerful organizations, very powerful um, entities do not allow this hypothesis to die. No matter how much uh, uh, evidence the real true science is providing for us. So the truth is that what causes heart disease epidemic and diabetes and cancer and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and obesity is a so-called metabolic syndrome. What is metabolic syndrome? You're eating too much sugar, you're eating too much flour, you're eating too many processed carbohydrates. That's what causes metabolic syndrome in the body. If you start your day with breakfast cereals, terrible, terrible, terrible junk to put into your mouth. If you eat vegetable oils, if you Live on bread, pasta, cakes, biscuits, snacks, crisps, chips, and, and other processed carbohydrates, and beer, and, and, and wash it all down with beer on top of that, which is a syrup. Then you're developing metabolic syndrome in your body, this disorder called metabolic syndrome. And that syndrome lays the ground then for development of heart disease, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, cancer, and many other disasters in your body. That what causes it. Not the meat, not the bacon, not butter, not eggs, not animal fat, not soup, not liver pate, not cream. None of these things cause heart disease. Those things actually build your body 
Build an immune system in your body. Build your strong brain so you can think straight yourself, not just listen to authorities and do what you're told. And it builds the, the human body from quality materials giving you a much better quality of life which again and giving you good health in terms of mm -hmm. in terms of fat um in, in terms of let's say a low fat meat like rabbit versus a high fat meat um and even high fat meat from diabetic animals uh, cows that are overfed corn for example um is there is there a problem with let's say diabetic fat as a source of animal fat? Animals have a powerful detoxification system themselves. They have their own mechanisms in the body, which would try to normalize, even if it is non-organic piece of meat, if these animals, even if these animals were fed chemicals and other things, they have a powerful detoxification system. So eating a piece of non-organic meat is infinitely safer than eating a carrot that has been directly sprayed with agricultural chemicals because plants don't have these mechanisms. They don't have these defenses. So I wouldn't, I had many, many patients who were on a very limited budget, who were poor, simply, simply put. So, and they still followed the GAPS diet by buying whatever meat they could buy. What I recommended to these people, you go to your local uh, butcher, you befriend your local butcher, and you buy a little piece of meat that you pay for, but then ask for a bag of bones, off cuts and organs. And many of these butchers give you these bones and off cuts and even organs for free, pretty much, or very, very cheaply. Because in the Western world, people don't understand the value of organs and bones. Nobody wants them. They go into a great big bin outside the shop, the butcher's shop, and it's just taken, I don't know where, and, and uh, thrown away or, or whatever. So you will get the most nourishing parts of the animal, the best for your health, for virtually nothing. And that's how all of these families heal. So you bring that huge bag of bones home, you put it in a freezer, get a second-hand freezer, a chest freezer, put it in your garage, or wherever you've got space, and fill it up with these bits and pieces, these, these, these uh, cheap off-cuts and bones and, and uh, organs. And you make your meat stock from them, and you make your stews from them, and you drink that meat stock, and you strip the bones like a piranha, after they've cooked for a few hours, all those gelatinous ligaments and capsules of the joint and bone marrow and everything else become soft. And these are the most nourishing, the most healing substances um, for us human beings and building substances for our human bodies. So it is possible to be healthy without spending huge amounts of money on your food. How about because, uh, nobody... rabbit as a low fat meat? Is that something that- rabbit Yes, so, okay. rabbit is unhealthy to eat on its own. So whenever you cook rabbit, you have to put for 100 grams of rabbit meat, you need 100 grams of beef fat, okay. or pork fat in there. <laughs> okay, and you can make a fantastic, a mean rabbit stew <laughs> by putting pieces of rabbit on the bone and then the same amount of fat in there, a few vegetables in there. Put a handful of your fermented vegetables in there, always. Always cook with fermented vegetables. Every soup, every stew, every mixture of vegetables should have a handful of fermented vegetables in it. You can cook them. Even in a cooked state, they will do you a lot of good, fermented vegetables. And for cooking, for this kind of dishes, I recommend to people to use the fermented vegetables, which were a bit less successful, perhaps. Your homemade fermented vegetables. I use fermented celery, fermented beetroot, fermented Brussels sprouts. For, for, for cooking, for these sort of things. Add a bit of water to that, spices, salt, pepper, it'll make a beautiful stew. And that rabbit will be good for you because it will absorb all the fat and all the other good things from the whole mixture. How about talking about fish? Fish is a wonderful source of nutrition. It's very good. Trouble is we polluted our oceans. And that's why the Western governments are now recommending to people to limit the fish consumption. Mercury level in the fish is particularly high and PCBs and uh, other man-made chemicals, unfortunately. The key in that is your own gut flora. What state your gut flora is in. If it is a very damaged gut flora and you have digestive disorders, be careful with fish because you will be absorbing all that mercury from the fish and mercury is fat soluble. It will accumulate in high fat tissues in your body. Your brain is a high fat tissue. 
the rest of the nervous system is a high fat tissue, your thyroid gland, your pancreas, your adrenals, your sex glands, your bone marrow, all high fat tissues, they'll become a dumping ground for that aluminum uh, for, and mercury and other uh, toxic things, other toxic metals, because they're fat soluble. But if you take care of your gut flora, if you look after your gut flora, make sure that it is healthy and robust and you're eating plenty of fermented foods, you can eat plenty of seafood. You can enjoy it in whatever amounts you want. Your gut flora will handle all that mercury. Because now we know that the beneficial bacteria, we have some research in that, that the beneficial bacteria in our gut are the most powerful chelators of toxic metals known to science. In their cell walls, they've got these uh, chelating molecules that grab hold of mercury, grab hold of aluminium, and will hold it until they take these metals out of you in the stool. How about uh, testing, the microbiome testing? Are there any uh, better or worse platforms for trying to assess the status of your gut microbiome and make recommendations for maybe how to fix it? I'm not fond of testing. Because testing is a human creation. It's expensive. You can, you can blow off an, a lot of money on testing and get absolutely nothing out of it. Absolutely nothing, no help for your patient whatsoever. So testing needs to be done very carefully. It needs to be done by a practitioner on a targeted basis. Most information can be got from talking to the patient, examining the patient, from gathering the whole history of the disease, history of the, the health of the person and, and, and the clinical science of the person. We don't need tests that much. When it comes to the gut flora testing, it's all testing stool. What we see in the stool is not the real gut flora. The real human gut flora lives on the walls of the digestive tract. It's not in the stool. What comes out in the stool is what's the body discarding. And majority of the microbial community there, according to our science, are bacteria. So the body is discarding this bacteria for some reason. It doesn't mean that these bacteria are the most numerous and the most important members of our microbiome, of our gut flora, because gut lining has deep crevices, deep protrusions. It's a very, very bumpy terrain with many, many high deep places. And that is where the gut flora, real gut flora lives, on the walls in those deep crypts. And nobody's testing for that, unfortunately. Our doctors do uh, millions of biopsies every year all over the world. Unfortunately, they all send to histology laboratories to see any cancer cells or whatever. And uh, not many people are, are, are sending them to microbiology labs to find out about the gut flora of the person. We need to change that situation. And it can only be changed if every single individual, when they're scheduled for a biopsy, demands from their gastroenterologist to send the sample to microbiology lab to examine their gut flora. Only then it will change. It comes down again to individuals taking responsibility for their healing and their health, not just sitting there and doing what you told. Okay, any more questions? <laughs> um, somebody's asking about, uh, um, I think they say lemonade cleanse, but I think that would just be a lemon cleanse, lemon juice cleanse, but other types of cleansing reactions, uh, you know, like what you were talking about with vegetarianism being a, or veganism being a, um, a cleansing diet. Um, do you have any kind of um, specific recommendations for um, fasts in, for example, your talks or your books? I've got a book called Vegetarianism Explained. Here it is. It came out in 2017, Vegetarianism Explained. Where I explain to people how animal foods work in the human body, how plant foods. And I have a whole chapter on fasting there, where I list all different fasts that exist in the world, starting from the most severe, where you just drink water and that's it. You eat nothing. And some people fast for 30, 40 days just drinking water. And uh, a lot of testimonies have been published <clears throat> of recovery from various illnesses. There are fasts when people just drink juices, homemade juices, or eat only one particular fruit or one particular vegetable, monofasts. There are fasts when uh, liquidarian fasts, when people live on liquids, when they drink herbal teas, juices, water, mineral water, uh, fermented beverages, 
can be drunk as well. And uh, then fast when people eat something and, uh, and exclude other things, and then the vegan uh, diet, which should not be called a diet, should be called a vegan fast. So there, there, is a, there is a big choice of fasts. A person who is underweight should never fast. Growing children should not be fasting. I don't believe that fasts should be imposed on children. That's, that's not a good idea, particularly young children. Pregnant women or breastfeeding women must never fast. That is not a good idea. So fasting should be only undertaken by a person who is uh, with normal weight or overweight and who feels toxic and whose digestive system just feels tired. They feel that they're not digesting their food very well. So it's a good idea to give your digestive system a break. Fasting, uh, whatever uh, form of fasting you're doing, must be accomplished, uh, uh, accompanied by enemas, daily enemas. So enema is a very important procedure that the fasting person needs to uh, acquaint themselves with. And uh, other things as well. You have to have time to sleep and rest and contemplate and meditate and uh, not impose working and uh, strenuous activities on yourself when you're fasting. So it, it is a serious undertaking. I recommend for people not to fast alone longer than three days. Starting from just missing a dinner a couple of times a week is quite enough for any person who just beginning with that, who never fasted in their lives. That will be a challenge enough. <laughs> just missing a dinner once in a while. How about enema procedure? And the body will a person okay. who wants to fast longer, sorry? I was going to ask about enema, like coffee enema, uh, water enema, tea enemas, um, electrolyte enemas. I'll talk about it in a minute, but let me okay. just finish with this train of thought. So um, if you want to fast on a long term, longer than three days, up to three days, it is safe to fast at home on your own without special preparation. But longer than three days, if you've never fasted, I do recommend you do it under professional supervision. There are situations when a person can get into trouble. A serious situation can develop. So it's a good idea to do it under professional supervision. Once you've done a long uh, fast under professional supervision, then you can, um, if you know what you're doing, then you can undertake that at home yourself. If you have a proper environment, you have the right kind of foods to fast with, unless you're just fasting in water. And uh, you have help nearby. And your family is supportive of all of that. Okay, so enemas. Enemas are a wonderful, wonderful procedure. They, they're as, as ancient as humanity. Enemas, it's a very safe procedure. Alternative to it is colonic irrigation. Colonic irrigation is pretty much the same thing, but it's done by a professional with a special big machine, and it will cost you a lot. And any good colonic irrigationist uh, worth their salt will tell you that one procedure is not enough. You need to do a course, 10, 15 procedures to really clean yourself out. And that can be quite costly, quite expensive. Well, with animals, you just get a kit, which will cost you no more than 20, 30 dollars, 15, 20 pounds here, and it'll last you many, many years. And you have a choice. Colonic irrigations are not allowed to put anything into the water by law in most countries. Where, when you're doing animals at home, you can do all kinds of animals at home. So for GAPS people, I recommend uh, to do a cleansing enema first with a basic enema solution. So what we do, we take a liter of water and we add to that one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda and one teaspoon of natural salt. Salt has to be natural, not from a supermarket. When you go on Himalayan crystal salt, rock salt or Celtic salt, because natural salt contains 92 minerals and trace elements, all of which are essential for the human body. Because majority of salt production in the world goes for chemical industry to produce plastics and pesticides and other things, they want pure sodium chloride. So salt that is mined from the sea or from the mountains is processed to produce this pure sodium chloride, which goes to the chemical industry and what's left goes into our supermarkets. That's a poison. That doesn't do anybody any favors. We should not consume that salt. Unfortunately, all processed so-called foods, all the junk that people eat, is full of that processed salt. 
which is another damaging element in, in those things. So don't have that salt in your house. If you have it, throw it away. You can use it for cleaning your sink or something. Buy Himalayan crystal salt or rock salt or Celtic salt, natural salt. And that is the salt that we should use for cooking, we should consume, and we should use in our animals. A teaspoon of salt will bring the animal solution more to a physiological solution to the concentration of electrolytes in the human body, which is more natural, physiological. Bicarbonate of soda is good because bowel naturally is slightly alkaline. We make the water slightly alkaline, so more physiological for the bowel. And also it brings down yeast. A lot of constipation, a lot of compaction in the bowel is caused by yeast overgrowth. It just grows through, your, through the wall of your digestive tract, into those uh, masses of stool that are stuck in there, holding them on, holding on to them, not allowing them to dislodge, and other debris in there. So it's a good idea for the basic solution. So what we do, we take a teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda, put it in a jug, in a glass jug, and we pour some boiling water from a kettle on it to allow it to release gas. It's important to do that to bicarbonate of soda before putting it into your body, whether you're drinking bicarbonate of soda or using it for animals. Release the gas from bicarbonate of soda first. Then we add a teaspoon of salt and top it up with warm water to make a liter, dissolving these two substances. And that's our basic animal solution for flushing the bowel out, for cleansing uh, old compaction, for removing constipation, for even if there is, if you've got a migraine, you're toxic. That means something is leaching out of your bowel, blocking your liver. So the liver cannot filter the blood properly, and you've got a migraine. You've got a headache. You just feel heavy. You just feel toxic. Empty your bowel. Clean it out with the basic animal solution. Then for an adult, it's a good idea to finish off with coffee. Coffee animals have been developed by uh, German nurses in the, 90, in, in, in the First World War, where they had all these young boys brought to them huge numbers without limbs, in terrible agony, in terrible pain. And they run out of all medications, apparently, in one place. The story goes. The nurses run out of all painkillers, of all medi even bandages. They just couldn't offer anything to these poor boys. And one nurse, in desperation, took a jug of coffee that was simmering there for the surgeons and made an enema from that coffee from one of this particularly suffering young man. He could not drink anything, so she's done it in an enema solution because she knows that coffee can help with pain. And this young boy fell asleep after the coffee animal. And that then episode was disseminated to all the other nurses in the German army and they all started using it as a pain killing procedure, coffee animals on their soldiers. And uh, that knowledge remained and Max Gerson, who was a German doctor, who started his work just after the First World War, picked up on that procedure and, and made it a standard in his uh, anti-cancer protocol, the Gerson anti-cancer protocol. These patients do four coffee animals a day. They're very busy people. <laughs> so now we have some research to show that when we put coffee into the rectum, the rich capillary bed of the rectum absorbs certain substances from the coffee into portal veins. These are the veins which carry the blood directly into the liver. So these substances reach the liver very quickly. And what they do with the liver, they put it into a, an overdrive of cleansing. It makes it process blood much faster, much more effectively, much more efficiently, dump all the toxicity into the bile, and then the capsule of the liver contracts and it squeezes all that toxicity into the digestive system in the form of the bile. And the bile then is conjugated by the microbial community in the gut and taken out of your system. All these toxins are taken out of your body uh, in that shape and form. So you cleanse not only your liver when you do a coffee animal, in a powerful way. You remove gallstones from your liver and you filter your blood. So you prepare the coffee before you start the whole procedure. Just you, There is a recipe on my website called gaps.me, how to make a coffee enema, or you'll find it online. Many, many websites give you that information. So you prepare the coffee first and leave it to cool. And then you make your bicarbonate of soda and salt basic enema solution and you go and uh, empty your bowel to make some room for the coffee. Many people, particularly constipated people who, whose bowel is very full, uh, it takes three or four animals with basic animal solution to 
really clean it out. So you put a liter in, you sit on the toilet, you empty. Then you make another liter, you put it in, you empty again. And you do that three or four times until no more solids coming out of you. Your bowel is empty. Then you put the coffee in. By then the coffee has cooled down. It should be slightly warmer than body temperature. The general rule with animals is if you want to flush your bowel, cleanse it, make the solution a bit cooler than the body temperature. If you want to hold it in for a period of time, make it warmer than the body temperature. So when we're flushing out the debris from our bowel, we, the, the basic animal solution will make it slightly cooler. But when we're putting the coffee in, the coffee should be slightly warmer than the body temperature. So when you put your hand in it, it needs to feel nice and comfortable, nice and pleasant. So that's the temperature you put in. I always recommend you put a tablespoon of homemade sour cream in the coffee. Sour cream will feed the lining of the rectum, of the sigma, of the, of the bowel nicely. Any kind of damage in there, any kind of, it'll, it'll heal nicely. It's full of vitamin A, full of vitamin D, another fat soluble vitamins. It's just beautiful. It's a very, very healing substance. So you can have your coffee with cream. <laughs> and then you put that coffee in and you hold it for about 15 minutes, for as long as you can manage. Many people can't manage 15 minutes. You hold it in for about 15 minutes and then you empty again. And that usually brings down migraine. If, if, if the migraine attack is just beginning and the person has done this procedure, the migraine will stop. It's just, a, it just stops migraines in its tracks. It stops hemorrhoids in their tracks. Any person with hemorrhoids needs to do this procedure as soon as the hemorrhoids start building up. Because what is hemorrhoids? Hemorrhoids develop because of high blood pressure in the portal system. That system of veins that collects all the blood from your digestive system and opens up into the liver. So between your bowel and your liver, that system of veins, there is a high blood pressure in there because the liver is congested and it's unable to process that blood fast enough. So when there is a high blood pressure in the portal system, the veins, the veins in the uh, bowel and in the rectum get stretched out, the, 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 the valves in them get broken quite often, and that creates the hemorrhoid, uh, hemorrhoids. That's what hemorrhoids is. Blood pressure in your general circulation might be perfectly normal, while in your uh, portal system you have a high blood pressure. So when you do that kind of enema, if you clear your bowel fully with the basic enema solution first, and then put a coffee in, hemorrhoids will disappear. In a couple of days, then you start working with the GAPS nutritional protocol on removing uh, the, the root cause of hemorrhoids long-term, which is abnormal gut flora. That might take years, that may, might take months, years for you, but as an immediate procedure, you just do a coffee enema every two, three days. As soon as your hemorrhoids start building up again, you do a coffee enema again, and you keep them down that way. And then eventually they will stop building up. So that's about the coffee animals. We can feed a person who can't eat for whatever reason through the rectum. That has been used in medicine for centuries. We can put meat stock into the animal. We can put sour cream. We can put fat into the animal. We can put uh, collagen in there, and that is gelatinous meat stock. Um, you can blend foods and put them into the rectum and let the person hold it there. A lot of nutrition will be absorbed by the rectum by the rich capillary bed in the, in the digestive system if a person cannot eat for whatever reason. So many things can be put into the animal which are healing and beneficial for the human body. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions about uh, raw milk and raw meat. Can you address that? Milk should be consumed only raw. And it should be consumed from animals which are native, natural breeds. Breeds of animals that Mother Nature created, not humans. That means that all milk from the supermarket is absolutely unsuitable. We should not buy milk in supermarkets, dairy products in supermarkets. Because in the 1960s or 70s, the industrial agriculture was not happy with how much milk an ordinary normal cow could produce for them. They wanted more milk per animal. So they gave an order to scientists to produce them a breed of animal that can produce more milk. So the scientists have come up 
very nicely with this Holstein Frisian huge black and white cow, which can produce three times more milk than a normal cow is able to produce. What they've done, they've selected animals with pituitary adenoma, with a tumor in the brain, and that tumor produces too much growth hormone, and as a result, these cows were producing more milk than a normal cow produces. And they're bred from these sick animals. So Holstein Frisian cows, this, this uh, commercial breed of cow, is a, a Frankenstein cow. It produces Frankenstein milk. It's not a real milk it produces. And 75% uh, of them, according to research, at any time have mastitis because these animals are sick. They all have illnesses. They're not natural animals. They have arthritis, they have infertility, they have mastitis, they have, they die from cancer, and they live about a third of normal cow life. A sick animal will produce sick milk. How can you take anything from a sick animal? So that kind of dairy should not be consumed. And our science indeed has accumulated huge amounts of research to show that this milk causes every disease under the sun. Every, every illness, including cancer, autoimmune disease, digestive problems, mental illness, anything, infertility, anything. Milk should come from animals that Mother Nature created. And these animals should be grazed the way Mother Nature designed them to eat. They need to be on organic, real pasture. With a plethora of herbs and grasses growing in a mixture on organic pasture, they need to be under the sun, then vitamin D will be in that milk and in the meat. And that milk needs to be uh, uh, consumed raw. We have now many, many farmers uh, all over the world who produce beautiful raw milk for us from animals like that, from native breeds of cow and goats and, and other animals. And uh, they use uh, strict hygiene procedures for milking. So the milk doesn't get contaminated after it left the animal. It's, it, it, it goes, it, it's clean, the whole thing. So there is no need to uh, worry about any infections in the milk, any, any problems in the milk. And uh, that milk is healthy milk and, and it should be consumed raw. Because milk of any animal is the female's blood, white blood, with red blood cells removed and some other elements removed. It has a live, active immune cells, white blood cells, active hormones, vitamins, enzymes, neurotransmitters, microbes, because our blood is not sterile and the blood of animals is not sterile. It's got its own blood microbiome, its own microbes. So it's a living matrix. It's a living substance coming in. When we pasteurize milk, we kill it. It becomes a dead substance full of dead, destroyed microbes, destroyed enzymes, destroyed nutrients. And it's very difficult for the human body to handle it. So milk should always be raw. All dairy products should be raw. About raw meat? Raw meat uh, has been consumed in every culture, traditionally. Uh, in many, many cultures all over the world uh, still remain uh, recipes where people eat raw meat. It needs to be very fresh. And it's usually pure muscle mass of the animal. It's, it's lean steak. Because the connective tissue of any animal, and that is a majority of the tissues in the, in the body of the animal, is the connective tissue, collagen, is very tough. You have to cook them for a long time to make them soft enough for us to chew and to eat. So it's usually lean muscle mass. So it's a steak, a lean steak or, or fillet steak or um, breast of a chicken, organic chicken or any other animal. So eating those when they're fresh, eating them raw, just marinate them with a bit of lemon juice, honey, salt, pepper, herbs, beautiful, very good for us, easy to digest and pro provides us with uh, very good nutrition in the right biochemical shape and form because it's unprocessed. Cooking does change the structure of proteins and makes the food a little bit more difficult to digest for us, apart from the connective tissue, because connective tissue we can't even chew in the raw state. And it is the most nourishing tissue for us. That is why all connective tissues, and that is ligaments and fascias and the capsules of joints and bones and stroma of the muscle and stroma of the inner organs, they need to be cooked in water for several hours to become soft so we can chew them and we can eat them and digest them. Because majority of all tissues in our human body is connective tissue, the tough tissue that holds us together, and that tissue renews itself all the time. 
cells constantly die out, new cells are born, and everything in the human body renews itself all the time. In order to give birth to trillions of cells every day, building materials are required. So we need to eat lots of connective tissue of other animals to maintain the physical structure of our own bodies. That is why making meat stock and soup and bone broth from all these tough tissues has been a traditional practice all over the world for millennia. And we need to continue with that. People have lost that skill in the last few decades in the Western world. And that is a major reason for why everybody's ill. We need to bring it back. In terms of coffee, um, do you have specific recommendations of like for, for, for both drinking coffee and for coffee enemas in terms of, for example, trying to minimize mold content of commercial coffees? Coffee is addictive altogether. So if a person has come off coffee and you haven't had it for a, for, for a long time, um, I recommend not going back on it. But one cup of coffee a day is okay. As long as it is quality, it's organic, and it is freshly ground coffee. It is better to buy uh, coffee beans or, or buy freshly ground coffee, properly sealed. And uh, it's okay to have a, a cup if, you, if your body can manage it and can tolerate it. But not more than one cup or two maximum. We actually have somebody who would like to ask you a question. Is that okay? That's okay. Cassandra? How much time have we got? Um, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Okay, I tried to unmute Cassandra and I didn't. So Cassandra, will you try to unmute yourself? Okay, can you hear me? All right. All right, hi Natasha. Nice to Hello. meet you. You are one of my heroes. So thank you so much for all your wisdom. I was wondering, um, my doctor is Dr. Uh, Thomas Cowan, and he was recommending uh, a sauna. I wanted to hear your opinion on saunas and health and detoxification. Sauna is wonderful because it's hypothermia that's wonderful. The raising temperature in our, in our bodies when we have temperature, we destroy cancer cells, we detoxify, we cleanse, we rebalance our immune system. Lots of wonderful things happen. There is a lot of research now to show that raising the body temperature can be used as a cure for fibromyalgia, for chronic fatigue syndrome, for Lyme disease, for cancer, for all kinds of things. And uh, in traditional cultures, people have used it, starting from Roman baths and Turkish baths and uh, sweat lodges of the Native Americans and Japanese hot springs and Russian banya and all, all this, this, this sort of things. So um, I like plain heat. I'm suspicious of the infrared saunas. We don't know enough of them, so I don't recommend them. But the traditional Finnish sauna where there is just a source of heat, uh, that's wonderful. And uh, I do recommend that on a regular basis. But the important thing for us to understand for all of us that if we have a temperature for common cold, get a common cold or some other infection, we get a high temperature, it is so important not to knock it down, not to start taking paracetamol or aspirin or, or, or something else to bring the temperature down. It is important to allow it to run because that is a major tool of our immune system for just giving you a complete MOT, complete rejuvenation for your body. It's important to give your body time and let the temperature run for as long as the body needs it to run. How high is the temperature uh, in, in your estimation? How high should you go? I would go up to 39 degrees um, Celsius, which is, I think, 104 Fahrenheit, 103.4 Fahrenheit, something like that. Something 103. Like that. 103. Fahrenheit, yes, up to, up to that level, uh, particularly in children, because in children or babies, you can get febrile seizures if the temperature goes higher than that. They are not dangerous. They don't require any treatment, but they can be quite frightening for the parents. So um, to bring it down, I recommend to use one of those tiny aspirin pills, 75 milligram, that are given to heart patients. Dissolve it in a glass of hot water and have a few teaspoons of that water. 
just to bring it slightly below that level, <laughs> slightly below that level, but not, uh, not drop it dramatically down and let it run. Just keep sweating. Use only natural fabrics, cotton and wool, no synthetics on yourself, on your bedding or your blankets. And keep drinking hot water with a, a chunk of lemon squeezed into it and eat hot, uh, uh, honey butter salt mixture. We take natural organic raw butter, soften it at the room temperature and then add a bit of honey to it. I think the patient should do it themselves um, to find how much honey, put a teaspoon mix taste not enough, add a bit more honey, mix and taste until your taste buds are happy because your body will tell you when it's enough. And then add a couple of pinches of salt to that as well, to that mixture. Keep it in this mixture, keep drinking hot water with lemon. Don't eat anything while you run the temperature. Your body is in no fit state to be processing food. You just need to replenish liquids and keep sweating, sweating, sweating. When the temperature comes below 37, 37.3 maybe, something like that. You have to find out what that is in Fahrenheit. <laughs> I don't know. And, and uh, then you can boil a chicken in water with some salt, make a lovely chicken stock, start drinking that stock, start eating that chicken, add a, a, a tablespoon of kefir into every uh, bowl of a chicken stock, eat nothing else. You'll come out of that cold as good as new. Okay. Uh, last question before I turn it over to Susan. Um, uh, the protein to fat ratio, um, how, how much is too much protein in, in your estimation? Eat natural foods and don't fill your head with scientific nonsense. Our science doesn't know what it's doing. I don't trust science. <laughs> you cannot call a piece of meat protein. It's not protein. It is a million times more complex and interesting than protein. You can't call fat just fat. Even animal fat is, has, has many other things in it. Eat natural foods and you will not go wrong. Nature has worked all that out for us. We don't need to be scientific. Susan? Well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, on our website, www.sbhi.com, we have about 20 years of health expert uh, videos archived so you can get more information there. We are a nonprofit, so we love donations, but I hate asking for money. Uh, there have been, but I'm not above it. Um, there have been many questions on, what are you doing, Steve? Many questions on prostate cancer, breast cancer, hormesis, uh, Lyme disease. And unfortunately, we didn't have time for those, uh, but I suspect the approach would be get your body as healthy as can be. And in certain cancers, a uh, ketogenic diet perhaps would be a part, but we'll cover that in future podcasts. I mean, read, read my book when it comes out, Gut and Physiology Syndrome. I'll cover all those questions there. I love you, Natasha. Love you Thank too, you. Steve. <laughs> uh, uh, we're not having a groupie here. Anyway, so um, you can find out more information. We welcome feedback. Um, we want to have more experts and want to do this weekly for a while. We want to get the information out because I, yeah, it's important we know this, that we're empowered and not just sit there and wait for the vaccines to save us. And we, you know, the syringe is not the solution to everything in spite of what Bill Gates says. So, um, you give me give us feedback you can email us on our website www.svhi.com and we will answer those uh we look forward to suggestions we want to share more of this in the future and thank you everybody for um keeping uh this going and thank you well let me also add that in the lower right hand corner of your chat box is a little uh, rounded square with three dots in it um, before this ends, you can save the chat, which has all kinds of comments from brief people and, and answers to questions that were asked. They're spread throughout it, and it's got links to things. Save that on your computer before you quit the meetup. And you can join us for, I mean, you know, we've got a membership thing that's on our website. So let's keep this going. Let's spread the word. Let's get the wor word out to the world. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>
Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, it worked good, didn't it? Yeah.